Okay, we're ready to get started for our final talk of the system administration mini conf. Paul Gear is here to school all those sysadmins who can't time sync good and want to learn how to do other stuff too. Hello, can you hear me? All good? I'm Paul. It's really great to be here. Thanks for coming. And I'm going to present to you the, the school for sysadmins who can't time sync good and want to learn to do other stuff good too. I want to thank GitHub for, this, for sponsoring the, uh, the whole conference and LCA for putting it on and the sysadmin mini conf for letting me speak. It's fantastic. I also want to thank Canonical whose conference policy lets me be here. It should go without saying I work for Canonical but I don't speak for them so please blame me for anything that's bad. So here's the plan. I'm going to justify why I'm talking to you about NTP. Someone in the volunteer team said to me this morning, how can you talk for 30 minutes about NTP? Well, I said, well, I cut it down from an hour, so I think I'm pretty right. <laughs> going to have an overview of Linux timekeeping, NTP concepts and algorithms, and I'm going to do an interactive installation configuration and hopefully troubleshooting, network permitting, um, a quick review of monitoring tools for alerting and telemetry, and then talk about the NTP pool and some comments on scale as it relates to the NTP pool, and common myths and misconceptions about NTP and best practices for avoiding that. And because I had to cut down some things, uh, my uh, experiences in building a sub $100 Stratum 1 server have not made the cut, unfortunately. I've got a lot of material prepared, so I'm planning to go fast. So I'll try and slow down for the important parts, but please come and see me if you miss anything. All right, caveats. I have no supermodel poses or bullet stopping looks, despite the title of this talk. So sorry if you feel ripped off. You can leave now, I won't feel offended. More seriously, unlike many of the people who stand here, I'm not an expert. I learned at NTP from operational experience from reading the documentation and from conducting mad science experiments. I'm not a member of the NTP project and I've never submitted a patch. I've never compiled NTP from source. I've only used the NTP reference implement, implementation. Pardon me. I've only used it on Linux and only with one reference clock driver, and only with a limited number of options. So I'm intentionally dumbing things down, ignoring use cases, and glossing over detail in order to keep it simple and short. The assumed environment is going to be cloud, enterprise, and small, medium business environments, rather than networks requiring high precision or research labs. For the purposes of this talk, the sort of time synchronization we're looking for is around the one to 10 milliseconds, which is fairly typical and fairly achievable in most networks. If you think that's way overkill, you may not be very interested in this talk. If you think it's way nowhere near good enough, then you may find this boring or be disappointed. I've heard, for example, mobile networks need around 10 microseconds accuracy. That's not what I'm aiming at here. And I'm going to assume basic to intermediate Linux knowledge, so I'm not going to tell you how to edit config files or what UDP is. So why should you care? Firstly, you might run Ceph or MongoDB or Kerberos or a similar distributed system, and you want it to actually work. For example, Ceph needs less than 50 milliseconds offset from its peers before it becomes grumpy and tells you about it in the health status. So, uh, Kerberos, I believe, is much more forgiving and allows about five minutes. I'm not sure about MongoDB, but the same principles apply to all of them. You might want your system logs to match across multiple systems, potentially across multiple continents. Or you might just like learning and tinkering, especially with embedded systems and learning about new technologies, newish. You might just think that bandwidth efficient, high precision time synchronization is pretty cool too. So, what is NTP? It is the standardized protocol for time synchronization. Uh, there's, it's up to version four and it's defined in RFC 5905. It is, in, has been in operation since 1985, so it predates the World Wide Web by several years. 
Uh, there's a simplified version defined in the same RFC and if you have to ever edit Windows control panels and set their time and date to windows, uh, time.windows.com, that's using SNTP and many appliances use it as well. And there are various implementations, but the reference implementation from the Network Time Foundation is what we'll be using today. I just want to take a quick side uh, aside to plug the Network Time Foundation. Harlan Sten is one of the is the main contributor to NTP, and he, his um, troubles with getting the Network Time Foundation fun well funded are widely publicised. So please consider supporting them. All of the examples I'll be using today are based on Ubuntu 16.04 long-term support, but the advice will apply to any distro that runs the reference implementation, probably m to most other implementations as well, and maybe even to other operating systems. So what's the issue with NDP NTP? Why do, I, why do I want to tell you about it? Firstly, it is one of the least well understood of the fundamental internet protocols. In my experience, most places I've worked, it was set up poorly. In many cases, that was my fault. Um, if, you were, if you worked at Queensland Police Service sometime after 1995 and you had to touch their HPUX NTP servers, please come and see me. I will buy you a drink. I'll, I'll buy you a drink every day of this conference. <laughs> it's, people don't bother learning about it until it breaks. It just sort of ticks along in the background most of the time. It's an old protocol with a checkered security history, sort of like SendMail or Apache. It's had some real clangers in terms of security bugs, but that's settled down in recent years and it's quite stable now, and most of the recent security issues are very simple and, and non-serious. Non the documentation is a little bit scattered due to its long history, and there's a lot of jargon in it that is sometimes a little inconsistent in its use. And it tends to require a certain initial level of knowledge. Misinformation, superstition, cargo culting are embarrassingly common with NTP. I, I highly disrecommend trusting everything at first sight that you read on server fault or stack exchange. Some of it is true. Just wanted to say that. But check, it, check it out first. Okay, let's look at some technical detail about how Linux keeps time. And Julian Goodwin gave a talk at LCA 2011 for history and general background to timekeeping. I highly recommend that if you want to know more about timekeeping generally and Linux clocks and many other types of clocks. All right, firstly, the kernel works in Unix time. If you've been around for Linux or Unix for any period of time, you'll have seen this. Date plus percent S gives you the current Unix time, you'll see it in squid logs, you'll see it in lots of different places, number of seconds since the epoch. And it's in UTC only, time zones are user spaces problem, and NTP deals only with UTC. The local clock is how NTP, or how the kernel tracks time, and it has a regular time or interrupt that's involved. And then there's also a real-time clock on many hardware platforms which keeps track of the time while the system's not running or suspended. And, but the local clock is the only one we need to concern ourselves with with NTP. There are two ways of changing the clock. Firstly is to set the time directly to a new value. Obviously, that makes the local clock jump, and it could be forwards or backwards. Also, you can ask the kernel to slew the time, which is gra gradually adjusted by speeding up or slowing down the clock, changing the length of seconds slightly. That obviously has the advantage that it keeps the local clock relatively steady and moving forward. NTP will use both stepping and slewing, depending on the circumstances, and there's some level of control over that in the configuration. So NTP makes some assumptions about the one true time. Firstly, there is one true time at UTC. That is the only time that is the one true time. Secondly, everyone, including me and everyone I trust, is deluded about how close they are to the real time. Thirdly, bad time servers may be run by inattentive persons or malicious parties may attempt to influence our view of the one true time. And network utilization and topology change constantly, so we can't make any assumptions about it other than what we measure. So, how does time come into NTP? 
the ultimate source of seconds is the oscillation rate of a cesium atom. NTP defines external sources as stratum zero, so things like atomic clocks, GPS, or radio clocks. Uh, if you're not familiar with how GPS works internally, there are atomic clocks on each satellite, and that is used to help you triangulate your data, uh, your position from the, from the timing data from the satellites. I believe radio clocks do something similar, but they're somewhat of a curiosity here in Australia. So NTP f starts at stratum one in terms of, of its protocol because that's, those are the servers that connect to the stratum zero clocks. That's usually through a local hardware interface such as a serial port or an expansion slot. And then stratum two and above get their time from stratum one and above. It's rare to see anything past stratum four or five on the internet and there's usually no call for it in your own networks. So these strata are, are somewhat analogous to IP subnets or Ethernet VLANs where they enable us to position our traffic in a particular way such, such that we can keep latency low or we can limit traffic to an administrative domain. And we'll come back to that a little bit more later. You don't need to be connected to a low stratum server, strictly speaking, to get accurate time. All right, let's see if I can make this demo work. Can everyone see that? Does it need to be pumped up in size at all? Yes, no? It's all good? Okay. So this is a, an Ubuntu 16.04 VM that I've created in our company cloud, and I'm just going to install NTP on it. Is that working? No? Ooh, okay. My, uh, my network connection might have dropped out. While that's coming back, I'll, I'll just have a um, talk about a couple of background things. Most distros nowadays, I believe, certainly Ubuntu, will um, automatically install. There we go. Did that work? Yes. They'll automatically install a time synchronization client by default. Under previous versions of Ubuntu, that was using NTP date, which is a simple NTP client that comes from the reference implementation. Under newer versions, that's handled by systemd's time sync D. But regardless, it will work and it will give you an SNTP configuration out of the box. So we've just installed NTP, and there are a few different items in the package that might be of interest, but the main one is the configuration file. And here's where I get to use my favorite regular expression. I'm just taking out the comments so we can see all of the configuration in one place. So there are four main sections of this configuration. Firstly, NTP tracks the accuracy or the difference between the local clock and its preferred time in the drift file. And that measures the frequency or the error rate of the local clock. Then it also is capable of making statistics, and we'll look at those a little bit later. Then the main section is where you define the pool of servers that you are getting time from. And in this case, the default is simply all of the Ubuntu pool and the Ubuntu NTP servers as a fallback. And then the final section is all the restrictions that are applied by default in order to prevent the system from being used in DDoS attacks. So I'm just going to edit that file to enable some configuration, uh, some statistics that they're disabled by default and just uncommenting the stats to var, lib, uh, var log NTP stats is where it stores them. And then we can restart to activate that change. Just before I, I switch back to the presentation, I'm going to do a query of NTP's peers so that we can have a look at that shortly. Okay, let's move on. I've sort of touched on a couple of terms here already. Offset is the difference between the local clock and a remote clock or a desired standard after network delay. And the network delay is measured as the round trip time on the network, not including the processing time on the server side. 
frequency, which we've also seen is called drift in the configuration file, is the error rate of the local clock in parts per million. And then a pole is one round trip check of a peer's clock. So polling is how NTV gets time. It uses UDP port 123, and there are several different types, including broadcast and multicast. We'll only be concerned with unicast for today. And you've already seen one of the unicast types, which is pool. Pool enables NTP to check the time server and, uh, sorry, it queries the DNS names of the time servers, and then if one drops out after it's been used, it will re-query DNS very helpful setting. That's the default nowadays. It used to be server as the default, which meant that if your IP address of your remote server changed, then you had to restart NTP to pick it up. And peer is for sync, uh, symmetric relationships. Okay, polling normally happens, uh, can, can have happened in anything from two to the three to two to the 17 seconds. So eight seconds to 36 hours, but normally around 64 to 1024 seconds. And it'll usually settle on 1024 seconds very, very shortly after startup, all things being well, including your network and your time sources being reliable. So this is a visualization of a pole, and there are timers recorded at each point. Two packets involved on the network, one from the client to the server and the server's reply. And there are timestamps taken. Each one is relative to its own clock, so the client keeps T1, T4, and the server tracks T1 and T2. This is true for every pole of every time source. Those poles are used in four algorithms. Firstly, each source is polled independently and the samples from it are checked for correctness or anomalies. Secondly, the preferred sources are selected using the intersection algorithm, and we'll look at that in more detail later. Thirdly, there's clustering, which takes the best surviving sources. And then the combining algorithm determines the correction to make to the local clock. The configuration gives you some control over how these algorithms worked, work in practice. But if you only have one source, all of them except the first one are basically null. OK, so let's have a quick jump back to our demo demo screen here. NTPQ is the query client and it is the main way that you will find out whether your NTP server is working well. And it's nice, easy to read tabular data. The peers are in the first column there called remote and then their, their peers or their local clocks depending on whether they're a stratum one server or not are the reference ID in the second column. The local, uh, the remote peers stratum is the third column, and that's fairly self-explanatory given our previous definition of stratum. T is the type, and you'll, you'll see here that these pool servers are left in there as a placeholder for when it needs to retry DNS lookups due to time servers dropping out or something like that. Uh, when is the last time the server was polled? Pole is the interval of poles, so how long before, between poles. Reachability is, a, is an interesting one. It's an octal number. I don't know why they picked octal instead of hexadecimal, since hexadecimal is much more familiar to programmers and sysadmins, and it would also save a column, but anyway. Um, it's a bitmap of the last eight poles, and each one represents a successful pole and each zero represents an unsuccessful pole. So mentally you need to convert that to binary and you can see in that particular example, because I'd only just restarted NTP, it had, had short pole times and each one had only succeeded in one pole. The last three, delay, offset and jitter. Delay and offset we've already talked about. Jitter is the root mean square average of the offset values. All three of those last figures are in milliseconds, not seconds. So they can sometimes run into each other if your clock gets a long way off. Let's just retry that momentarily. Now you can see that the reachability in all of those, that's excellent, they've all, they've all succeeded for five poles now. So three, seven in octal is zero, 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 one, 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 one. 
So we've had the last five poles succeed. All right, let's keep going. Okay, quick deep dive into the intersection algorithm. If you forget everything else I've said about NTP, remember this bit. If you've gone to sleep, now's the time to wake up. The intersection algorithm is the part of the time management process with the most significance for configuration and troubleshooting. It is, its goal is to find the largest possible agreement between the defined sources about the one true time. And it does that by finding the interval with the highest low point and the lowest high point of the majority of peers. Say that again to yourself a few times to try and make sense of it. I don't find that very easy to understand, so, and neither do a lot of other people, so they visualized it. This is a, a diagram that I've found. This was the most helpful diagram I found in um, Deeth and Brunette from Sun's Blueprint series from about 15 years ago. Um, it shows how there are six defined time sources and they've all got a different, the width of the bar represents the delay and then the position of the middle bar relative to zero indicates the offset. So you can see here that there are four good time servers and two bad ones. And then I looked at that and went, hang on a sec, that's just a stock ticker graph turned on its side. So I'm going to do something with GNU plot. And I, I took my NTPQ output and piped it into a GNU plot script. And so this is just a simple way to help you understand the configuration of your, or the, the state of your peers in, uh, in NTP. Um, if you get the slides and click on that link, it'll take you to the script on my GitHub repository. All right, monitoring. Everyone knows that if you're not monitoring a service, you don't care about it, you're not managing it. So a few general comments first. Um, set it up before you need it. Um, the statistics that we enabled are extremely useful, especially if you're trying to run a stratum one clock. Secondly, make sure you're using pool rather than server. Older configurations came with that as a default, and if, you, if your version of NTP supports it, you should use it. It really does help um, save a lot of mucking around. Decide in advance on what to alert on. NTP is a little bit of a an alerting canary for a whole raft of bugs um, and if your network is ever saturated which no one's ever is then um, that's the first thing that starts alerting you because all your NTP servers become unreachable. So what do we all use for alerting? If you've got something else I'm, I'm all ears. Nagios seems to be it. I, I don't know why. Uh, it has some default plugins about NTP. Um, firstly, check NTP time, which checks the remote, uh, a remote host offset rather than looking at the local host, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, check NTP peer. It's, it's not too bad. It's a good start, but it allows rather large offsets, like a whole second, which in NTP terms is an eternity. There's some third-party plugins. Uh, the best of them was Check NTPD, and if you like Perl, it's probably a good choice. Um, telemetry is a little better. There are a number of different systems. Collecti reports the frequency, system offset, and error, which I'm still not clear on what it means, even after reading the source code. And it also reports metrics of offset, delay, and dispersion about each peer. Um, Prometheus is a popular uh, telemetry system written in Go it has an NTP collector. It, ha it also collects the offset of the local clock from a configured peer. So you have to configure the peer once in NTPD and then once in Prometheus, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it also graphs the stratum, which if, you're a, if you have a normal NTP server's stratum graphed, it goes like this. Not very exciting. Uh, Telegraph is, a, is another system written in Go. It has an NTPQ input plugin. It, it basically takes NTPQ minus PN that we saw there just before and graphs all of that. Um, it's a little immature, has, uh, 
has a couple of bugs that I found within reading it within a couple of minutes and I don't even really know Go. Um, I've submitted some patches and issues about that. But because I wasn't happy about that, I committed one of the classic blunders, XKCD 927 to the rescue. And I created a check in Python. There's an alerting, uh, an, a Nagios alert called check into PMON and a telemetry collector called NTPMON. The collector currently supports Collecti and Nagios performance metrics, but Telegraph and Prometheus are coming soon. And it, its goal is to pr promote, uh, provide actionable alerts about the local NTP server. So it's encouraging you to make your local NTP server work correctly and be configured correctly. It aims for Ceph's preferred offset of 50 milliseconds or preferred maximum offset and checks for a number of different things like the number of peers, the reachability of peers overall, whether time's in sync and what the offsets are like. All right, NTP pool, you have already seen this in the configuration file. It's the default worldwide virtual cluster of NTP servers. It's run by volunteers. Um, if everyone wanted a time server in the pool, you'd need 2.6 million clients per server, uh, uh, wanted time from the pool, apologies. There'd be 2.6 million clients per server because there are only about 2,600 IPv4 and 1,000 IPv6 servers in the pool as at the beginning of this year. So more are needed, please consider running a pool server if you uh, have some spare bandwidth and a VM or two. It's a default server, uh, NTP service for many distros and appliances. And if you're going to use it as a vendor, a, an appliance vendor, please read the guidelines and you'll see why in just a moment. Or, ordinarily, running a, a server in the NTP pool is quite reasonable in terms of bandwidth, memory, and CPU. They're char uncharacteristically low. The one thing that you sometimes have to watch out for is your contract tables, either in IP tables or in some cases in switches that are flow-based. Flow a flow-based switch is tracking all of the packets and that can cause troubles if you have a big spike. Ordinarily, except on December the 13th last year when Snapchat released a version of their iOS client that queried between 35 and 60 NTP servers every time a user opened the app. It's still not clear why they needed to do this, but I got in the order of 40 times the number of unique IPs per hour and double the number per day and seven times peak packet count and six times peak byte count. If you can see it down the end there, that's the normal background traffic of 1.5 million NTP, unique NTP clients per day. And the rest is, you can see. However, the server actually handled this pretty well. It was a one gig VM, just very similar to the one I just ran up. And NTP is only 76 bytes in IPv4 for each packet and 96 in IPv6. All right, how much time, more time have we got? Three minutes, okay. This section was going to be much, much longer, but I've cut it down due to trying to get on time. I'm gonna make a lot of assertions here, but um, if you want to know the data behind these assertions, I've got weeks worth of, that I've gathered to back it up. Firstly, the local clock is good enough. Lots of people rely on the local hardware clock in their, their Linux server. Just don't do that. <laughs> One of mine gained 2.5 seconds per day when I tested. Uh, next myth, NTP doesn't work in VMs. That's a hangover from old kernels. It's fine on modern kernels with some caveats on certain hypervisors, which I won't mention, come and see me after. You don't need NTP in VMs is a curious um, myth because it seems to be almost exactly the opposite, but if it's a separate kernel and, you need a, and it has a separate clock, so you need separate time sync. You don't need to be connected to the internet. This is not exactly a myth because obviously the stratum one time servers get their time from something other than the internet, but you need a connection to multiple stratum one servers no matter how you do it. Another myth, you should only have one authoritative source. This is simply not true in terms of NTP's algorithms. 
It works best with multiple sources. Four to 10 is preferred. It can actually have many more than that without any problems. Another myth, it doesn't work behind ADSL. I can get less than five millisecond offset from most time servers. Preferred configurations. So this is how um, just some basic suggestions point you in the right direction depending on your environment. For a standalone cloud instance, just using the default configuration will get you a GeoDNS lookup from the pool and it'll probably work pretty well. The one thing you might change is to, is to use the local country zone to minimize your latencies. Within a cloud environment with interrelated services, you want to run designated NTP servers, although they don't need to be dedicated to just that, as long as they've got good connectivity to the rest of your cloud environment. And don't run containers on a host you don't control if you care about time sync, or at least monitor it very closely. For a large data center with thousands or millions of bare metal hosts and VMs, what you want to do is have a separate service stratum between your stratum one servers and your clients. That makes your stratum two servers expendable and isolates your stratum one servers from your clients, which means that you can change them around as necessary. And in large distributed organizations where you have multiple sites with um, a large number of clients, you might use a distributed service stratum but still work on the same general principle. And for a small office, your accuracy requirements are very low and your, your cost of appropriate hardware is high, so use the pool and tinker with low-cost GPS stratum one sources. If you have a dedicated server or a full-featured router, you can use that as a service stratum between your clients and the pool. All right, takeaways. TimeSync is fun and not too hard. Learn the basics and read the documentation to avoid the myths. Base your decisions on data that you get from monitoring and start with a good design and your solution should scale as large as you need without much effort. Thank you for listening. Um, there's a blog series where you can get more detail. You can also get the slides. And I've done a great thing because there's no time for questions, right?